Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Hey, Andrew here. Wanted to talk about a new surrealist writing technique that I invented. Um, the surrealists uh, had all sorts of like little games that they would play. Uh, one of the big ones would be like um, taking newspaper clippings and just assembling them at random into stories, for example. So the surrealists invented all sorts of games like this that you could play to come up with strange phrases. Um, another one would be like one person would make an if statement and then another partner would make like a then statement so you could get weird if then pairings or one person would write questions and another person would write answers and then you would pair the questions and answers up at random after like say shuffling them in a hat or something. And you could come up with all sorts of strange answers to questions even if they were like rudimentary or obvious questions with obvious answers. You could come up with strange answers to them and then you could just associate for yourself why it is that the answers actually work, even if uh, there aren't answers that you would come up with on your own. And that's kind of the power of, of surrealist techniques is that you wouldn't ever necessarily think of doing this on your own, but when, the, when there's a bit of randomness to it, it opens up a door to something deeper than what you're consciously thinking about. It gets into something subconscious. And I think personally too, what I like about surrealist writing techniques is that you're able to tap into something like almost magical and more full of imagination because when the human brain is forced to make meaning from something that might be meaningless, then you're liberated theoretically. Um, and I don't mean as in theoretically, as in in theory you're liberated. I mean, you're liberated to begin to theorize. You can actually theorize meaning in any way you want, precisely because there's this juxtaposition of things that would not normally be together. So that's, I like it because I love theory and I love to invent meaning. And I think that's one of the powers of philosophy, for example, is that, is that you can invent meaning in things. And human beings will find meaning in just about anything. Um, just like we'll see faces when there aren't faces in shadows or trees. Uh, I think meaning is a lot like a human face. I think human beings will find it just about anywhere. And so with surrealist techniques, you can actually find meaning um, yourself without, acting, without actually trying to impose meaning onto a text at the beginning. Write what you want to write and the meaning will come through automatically. Now the more extreme surrealist techniques will force you to do a lot of theorizing. But there are like less extreme ones where you're a little more free to kind of let the conscious brain take over during the writing process and those won't produce um, necessarily the need for the reader to do all that much work. You know, you can actually have a narrative and have a plot and have characters and all the normal things we think of when we think of fiction. Um, of course, you can write poetry, though, too, and the like. The one I came up with, though, um, has actually been pretty fun. I've been able to write a, a story with it, a poem, and I'll talk about the story today. But basically, you take a, a book, any, any text, newspaper, the one I took was uh, this book right here, Leonardo Carrington's uh, Complete Stories. This is a surrealist painter um, during the early parts of the 20th century. She actually lived throughout the 20th century, but um, her work is um, you know, phenomenal, honestly. She's one of my favorite painters, and her short stories are really uh, magical. I think one of, the, one of the words was like delirious that came to me. Um, I think it was like on the back. They had said the word delirious or something in one of the, uh, you know, the advertisements they'll do to why you should read this book. And that word kind of stuck to me, that delirious word. Um, they are, at times, very delirious. Um, things will just sort of mesh together. There's a lot of references um, to food and to royalty and to witches and to magic and to dark magic and to violence. Um, but the violence is always very, almost like Python-esque, Monty Python-esque. It's very silly. Um... It isn't very serious. And the surrealists certainly have a power to be able to get a death in that way. But that's another subject for another day. Um, the technique is you'll take a book. So I, again, I took Leonardo Carrington's short stories. And you close your eyes and take a pen. I don't have a pen on me. I didn't plan this out. You can take your finger too. And close your eyes and just point at the text. And what does it say? This one says corridors. Okay, cool. So that's your first word. And you close your eyes again. Maybe turn to a different page if you want. Poke again, this one says courageously. That's actually really cool. Um, I can't believe that we just did that randomly. That's the power of surrealist writing techniques. 
Um, so corridors courageously. That's I should write that down before I forget it. I'll try to remember for the rest of this video. Corridors courageously. Um, that's such a cool phrase. I mean, we got lucky with the alliteration. If they both begin with a k, sign kind of sound. Um, they both have a uh in there too. Corridors courageously. There's a lot of like assonance and alliteration going on in the beginning. Um, they also kind of flow off the tongue really well, which is you know you never know what you're gonna get. But now you've got your two words. So you write those two down, and you do this again and again and again, and you keep getting pairs of words together. Um, you can get five, you can get 20, you can get 100, you can get as many as you want. Remember the order that you get them in, though, because when you go to write your poem or your story or whatever it is you're going to write, your essay, um, these words have to appear in order. So the first pair has to come first, the second pair has to come second, etc., uh, etc. Et now the, pairs for the, rule for the rule for the pairs themselves is that the pairs must come together in the text. So when I'm writing... Corridors, courageously, must come together. Now, if I have to put a comma in between them, that's fine, or a period, or a hyphen, or an m-dash, or whatever. Um, not a hyphen, an m-dash, or a hyphen, maybe in some cases. You know, if I have to put a colon, if I have to have one thing be a sentence, and then quotes, and then courageously, the second word starts with a new quote, right? If the characters are talking to each other, one character's sentence ends with the words corridors, and the second character's sentence starts with the word courageously, right? Whatever you have to do to make it work, but they have to appear next to each other. There can be no other words in between. Grammatical devices can come in between. This is the rule that I've used. If you wanted to do a different rule, you could do different rules. You could allow yourself one word in between, and it kind of ruins it. You could allow yourself maybe, but you could go stricter, for example, and say uh, no grammatical devices. Like These words have to come next to each other. That would produce some weird um, nonsensical grammatical structures. So I allowed myself the ability to insert grammar in between just so that I could at least have that little bit of breathing room. So you've got corridors courageously, you might have 15 more pairs, they're gonna appear in order. And again, this will produce some really cool phrases. Not only does it produce cool random things like corridors courageously having the alliterative and assonance uh, qualities in the beginning of the, of the words, but you also get some other really cool phrases. For example, I'll just read some of the ones I got when I wrote a short story. So I got, the first one I got was nose poor. That's, that's just kind of funny. Uh, nose poor. I think noses are pretty funny. Um, right, but nose poor can mean anything. You could put nose poor together without any other words as just a phrase to say that someone was like nose poor. So maybe there'd be someone who's like nose rich and someone who's nose poor. Maybe they have a small nose. Um, right, so you could imagine someone being nose poor as a phrase. But you can also put a comma in between nose and poor, um, etc. You could put a colon in between nose and poor. What I ended up doing for nose poor Oh, as I ended up doing, the, the, poet, the poem be, or the story begins, she sniffled her nose, period, and then there's a quote, poor me, poor me. So she sniffled her nose, poor me, poor me. So you can do that too. So that would be an example of doing nose poor. Um, so then there's other great ones too, embellished dress, bitter window. Bitter window is an example of a time when the two words just form a phrase perfectly. A bitter window, I mean, you know, you don't need to have any grammatical uh, devices in there to make that work. But there are ones like height roasting, woman crying. You can see how these would be a little more difficult. Promise federal. I can't, at least off the top of my head, think of a sentence in which promise federal would, would appear next to each other without any grammatical uh, intervention. Maybe you can, though. That's the trick. And then there's another one with you, question mark, Cole. You don't always have to include the grammar, but I thought for this one, I was like, that'll be challenging. Let me include you with the question mark, and then let me have whole. And I believe when I wrote the poem, I followed that rule and I kept the U with the question mark and then did the um, whole, the word whole would appear right afterwards. So that's a question you have, that you can ask yourself when you find these pairs of words, if they're attached to grammar already, do you want to pull the grammar to or just the word? If you pull the grammar, it's obviously going to make it a little tougher for you. So you can play around with those things. Kill chair was another one. Um, shining south, I'm just skipping around, though nocturnal. Uh, fashionable were, man boys, fetching, exhausted, odd thirst. Odd thirst would be another one that already works without you having to do much. Uh, fetching, exhausted, for example, doesn't do much. What you're noticing though is that like with fetching, exhausted, you're getting um, what something that looks like a, a verb and an, and an adjective, right? Fetching, exhausted. But what I did is, is when I wrote the story is I turned fetching into an adjective. So I said that someone is fetching, not that they are fetching in the activity or in the process of fetching something, but they are like a fetching person. Um, so you can do that too, and you're allowed to, 
it really gets you to think about nouns and verbs and adjectives and how to change them around in order to make them work because you're forced to make them work. Um, and then, and then of course, as to meaning, well, you can do anything you want. The the story I wrote took a lot from from Carrington's sort of um, fantasy world, and you don't have to do that. I mean, if you you know if you chose a philosophical text, you didn't have to like respond by writing a philosophical essay just because the words you got were from a philosophical text. But I would be curious to see as people got these various words together if the source they got the words from really influenced the text that they then wrote. And I've been trying to come up with different ways to play around with that too, like maybe if you and a partner did it, and the partner chose the pairs for you and sent them to you, then you would have no knowledge of the story that they had read or where they got these words from, you would just be presented words. And you would write. And then that would be interesting to see the ways in which what you wrote with these words either differentiated from the source text, or maybe in strange ways they'll actually align with the source text. And then you can get the source text and get the words together, um, throw them together, and kind of see interesting ways that they might juxtapose and what kind of meanings might be found in there. And remember the trick to meaning, at least to me, is that meaning is everywhere. So it would be really difficult to write a meaningless text because the human brain will, will come up with some kind of meaning, um, inevitably. So you can play around with almost anything that would be uh, quote unquote random and get all sorts of cool um, things. So I won't share the whole story with you, but that's the process. You get pairs of words, you keep them in order, the pairs have to appear together, and then the order has to go in order. So when I got nose poor, embellished dress, moments more, bitter window height roasting, woman crying, in the story, those you know six pairs will come in the order that I just listed them. So moments more won't be first, nose poor will be first, embellished dress will be second, etc. Um, that's just another structural thing that doesn't allow you to get too conscious with your ability to like twist things around and, and plan. You don't really want to plan too much with like surrealist techniques. You kind of want to allow yourself to just write. Um, and if you can sort of work your automatist muscle a little more while you're doing this, then all the better. And for those that don't know, automatism is just the practice of kind of allowing yourself to write words. Um, the way I like to do it is I like to, without thinking, the way I like to do it is um, to think about sounds instead of thinking about words. Um, words already have meaning. Phonemes, there's been some, some, some interesting uh, statistical or theoretical work especially that's, that's kind of gone into whether or not phonemes have meaning. But for the most part, when you're thinking of phoneme, you might just, a phoneme, you might just have like fa, And fa doesn't necessarily mean anything. So you just have fa, and you're thinking fa, fun, fa, fun favor, f f f f you know, f f yeah, etc. And you're just coming up with these sounds, and then when you get to one that you like, you just kind of write it. So maybe you do have like fun. So you have fun, and then you're like, um, what's coming to me next? Uh, s s with an S or something, so like fun, strange, okay, fun, strange. And then you just write like that. And try not to second guess yourself, try not to think about too much, and just write. And I uh, wrote the, the Girl and the Doctor, both parts of that so far, using the automatist technique. And that's on my website as well. But um, these are just surrealist techniques. So when I was writing with, the, with these word pair ones, I would still try to be automatist in between. So you can't be automatist with the words because the words exist already structured for you. But in between those words, you definitely have a lot of space to be somewhat automatist. Um, I was less automatist in this one than with the Girl and the Doctor, um, which you can read on my website but I was still able to at least um, adhere to somewhat to automatism. So that's really all I have to um, say about that. I mean, to me, the, the story I wrote, um, I, I don't have a name for it, it's just the, the witch story. Um, it's about a witch, I think that's very Carrington-like. I also noticed that there was um, a lot of references to food, which Carrington's book has tons of. There was a lot, of, like I said, a flippancy towards death in the work. Um, there was definitely some surrealism in terms of imagery, not just in terms of like the, the process of the writing, but the imagery was also very surrealist. The witch in the story has um, trees for hands and her fingers are like branches and they have like uh, canopies going all around. Um, so when she like wraps her arms around things, she wraps them like a giant, two giant trees or several trees or like almost like a forest kind of wrapping around. You can see the canopy um, as, it, as it wraps around a thing. So that's a very surrealist sort of image. She's got broomsticks for legs, uh, things like that. The smoke in the story speaks to her, so, so the smoke is talking and sort of taunting her. That's, uh, that's, that's decently surrealist as well. 
So you can go on with this. There's also some references to royalty and monarchy, and of course a lot of nature references. Um, Carrington's work has almost exclusively takes place um, in in like natural settings, and even when it does take place in like domestic settings or inside buildings that are usually sort of um, strangely haunted and yet fancy, like it look like rich, but. Uh, <laughs> but clearly also at the same time like haunted or strange um even when that's happening there's always like a bird there's always a horse um carrington loves is always fascinated with horses so there's always some kind of natural element being intermixed um in with it so there's definitely a lot of that in the story i wrote too and again it's interesting to hear the ways that to look at the ways that the story you end up writing with this technique will match the source text um or differ from the source text so that's it for today um thanks for listening if you actually ever do these pairs, um, you can check out my website to read the story and see all the pairs that I used. But if you ever actually come up with your own, please, you know, uh, shoot it over to me. Let me know if you publish it on your website uh, or if it's a poem or if it's a lyrics for a song or if it's a short story or whatever. Um, definitely shoot it over to me, email it to me or comment here with your website or something on YouTube or wherever you're, you're listening to this and let me know. I will check it out for sure. That would be really cool. Um, outside of that, if you also ever are interested in sending me some pairs to write a story with, and I could in return send you some pairs, and I'll send you the same number of pairs you send me. Don't send me a hundred maybe, that might be a lot, but you know, send me a good amount, or why not send me a hundred, I'm not going to stop you. If you send me some pairs, I'll write a story, and I'll send it to you, and I'll send you pairs as well, and then you can use my pairs to write your own story, and that'd be cool, and then we could kind of compare notes, and then reveal, of course, the source for the uh, pairs. So um, I hope you enjoy the technique. If you have any questions about it or want to see an example of it, like I said, the story will in the in more explainer notes will be on the website. And um, other than that, thanks again, and I'll see you soon with a new video. I'm gonna try to post videos off the cuff more more frequently instead of doing such uh, strenuous like video essays, which I love to do. They do take a lot of time, and they don't allow me necessarily to just kind of like free flow speak about what's on my mind. So I'm going to try to do more off-the-cuff videos in the future, so hopefully you'll be seeing more of me. Um, that is, if you want to see more of me, of course, maybe you don't. In which case, what are you doing watching this video? How did you make it 10 minutes into this, or how long this is? Shame on you. Turn the thing off already. All right, bye. <laughs>